Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, a webinar that we um, broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, all of the sessions are recorded, so if you're unable to join us live on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and watch all of our recordings. We've got about four years' worth of them out there now every week. Uh, so you have a lot of things that you can watch if you want to. Um, we do a variety of things on the show. We do um, presentations, interviews, book reviews, little mini training sessions. Basically, anything that has to do um, that's vaguely related to libraries, we will um, we'll put it on the show. <laughs> um, we have commission staff that do presentations, and we have guest speakers, as we actually have today. Um, on the line with us this morning is um, Stacy Shank. She's from the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Um, hi, Stacy. Hello. Hello. And um, the DHHS has a new website out there. I'm not sure how new it is. Uh, it's been out for about two years now. About two years? Okay. So I have a website there, and she's going to take us through um, some resources that librarians can use on the website to um, help their patrons with all the different services and that um, Department of Health and Human Services offers uh, to our communities. So I will just uh, turn the um, show over to you, Stacy, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Krista. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Krista stated, I'm Stacy Shank, and I am from the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with our agency, we have a lot of different parts to the agency. So what I represent is the Economic Assistance Division, which deals with people that have financial struggles or medical struggles, and we have some programs to help them with things like that. So we did start um, a program called Access Nebraska uh, back in 2008 is when we started to work with it and so we, what we want to do is show you some of what we do. Um, first of all I just want to go over what a community support specialist is. It's a position that was created by Access Nebraska and there are now nine of us throughout the state um, throughout the different service areas and we're really a liaison for the local community partners which the libraries are considered a part of. So we're a resource for you if you need to contact us. Um, for those of you that need that resource just so you have that information. If you ever need to contact me, you can contact me by stacy.shank at nebraska.gov. And I can also get you in contact with the other community support specialists in your area if they are closer to you. Uh, we build and maintain our community partner network. We can provide, provide training to community partners such as what we're doing today. We can tailor that to um, the client's needs or we can tailor that to your staff needs. Really we do whatever we need to do within the community to help promote and educate people on our services and how to access those. So if you need me to answer questions, update any services, things like that, um, we are continually changing throughout this process, which you see through this presentation. So we want to make sure that everybody has the most current information about our programs and our services. Um, we also do receive and investigate concerns and or complaints. Um, if there's something that's just not working right or somebody is out there in the wind and can't access our services, we don't want them to not be able to do that. So we are a point of contact for that as well. Access Nebraska itself is simply the modernization of our economic assistance services. Um, what we want to do is be able to deliver it in several different manners. Um, so we have added this online process to apply and check on benefits and things like that in addition to the traditional methods of access. So the important thing to know about this is we haven't taken away the local contacts. Um, actually, there's some things that have been changing lately, and I'll explain that as we go, too. But you can still access services through paper applications and those traditional phone lines and things like that. But we do have these added benefits now for people who don't have time to do it that way or come into an office. I just want to give you a little bit of history. In 2008 is really when this process all started, and it's when the governor began to have us investigate where we could go with our services and how we could provide them more effectively. Um, so they went to different states and looked at some processes that were already in place. And as Nebraska um, generally does, we took these pieces and put them together in our most effective manner possible and made it our Nebraska way. 
So in 2008, we did get the online applications up and running on the website, and that was the beginning of this Access Nebraska website itself. Since that time, there's been a lot of changes through the years. Um, in 2009, our work groups began seeing what we could do to make things better. So we began to take all of the paper files that we had that the workers had and image those and put them into the computer so that the workers throughout the state don't have to send files back and forth any longer. They can all access that information right online and help a client no matter where they're at in the state. We also made it so that people could report to us online as well. Instead of just applying, they could provide us information as that information in their lives changed. Um, we selected our customer service center sites, and there's actually four of them throughout the state. There's one in Lincoln, which began our pilot process um, in, in, again, taking the calls in Access Nebraska. So they were our pilot for six months to make sure that that would work. Um, the other ones are in Fremont, Scotts Bluff, and Lexington. We still have our local offices also in place. So that is what we call our universal case management system. Um, we began a phone line at that time also that was a 1-800 number, which was the only number that people needed to know at the time in order to call into any four of those customer service centers. And we use an interactive voice response unit on those phone lines so people can either push the number on the phone or they can actually speak to the phone and it will send them and route them to the person they need to speak to. That's also when our benefit inquiry um, system began. People could go online and check and see what benefits they're currently re receiving. In 2011, the majority of our mail began going through what we call our document Im imaging centers. Um, those are, for short, called an ANDI center, A-N-D-I. And those two centers are located in Omaha and Lincoln. So one half of the state just has one address. They don't have to worry about where to send mail to any longer. They all send it to the Omaha address, and I'll give that to you here in a little bit. And the other half of our state sends everything to the Lincoln address. Um, there are huge scanners in the rooms that scan uh, thousands of documents in a day, and those are scanned in within 24 to 48 hours so that the workers can see them no matter where they're at in the state. Uh, we also began being able to receive documents online with the Submit Documents feature, and people could scan them into us as well along with faxing them in. So people no longer have to just be dependent on the mail system and the delays that are caused sometimes by that or the loss of documentation sometimes that's caused by that. Our Fremont and Scottsdale customer service centers began taking their calls that year as well. In 2012, it's been a very big year for us. Um, at the beginning of the year, we started having all four customer service centers taking calls and start to work as one unit. Um, we converted every single case over to our universal case management system. So we, we did complete that um, by March. And the new application that we came out with here in October has the ability to create a client benefit account and a more detailed release of information section. So before the, the clients couldn't um, give us exactly who they wanted to receive their documentation besides themselves, now they're able to do that. And they can also create their own account while they're in the application itself instead of having to go in and do it later. And I'll explain how that works in a little bit, too. Um, we began to include these PIN numbers, which are important to set up accounts on our review letters. We have updated our website so that now if a person goes in to do a review, the computer will pull in their information and auto-populate that application for them. And then all they need to do is go in and change things so they don't have to sit there for the traditional 20 to 40 minutes, depending on how well they are versed in the computer, to fill out the application. It'll, it'll fill itself out if they've done it before. And our energy assistance program, this is one of our, our great triumphs, um, is now included in what we call the InFocus. Um, so when the clients call in, that information is also right available in the screen that the workers are looking at. They no longer have to go to a, another site to do that. So a lot of improvements this year that we're very excited about. The advantages to applying online for the clients are obviously it's a lot faster and it saves them time because once they hit the submit button on the application, that application comes to us and there's a person that pens it. So usually, you know, if, if they submit it in the morning, by the end of the day we have it. Definitely if they're submitting it in the middle of the night, you know, we'll have it the next day as well. It protects their privacy. They don't have to mail things around and worry about who's going to see it. Um, it's all directly to us. 
and they can gain access to us with any computer with internet. So, you know, it's convenience for them, whether they're at home, they're on a friend's computer, where you guys come into play, obviously, is they may be at a library. And hopefully, when they do come to the library, some of them, what we've learned, are they aren't very computer savvy. So if you can just even help them just learn how to work the mouse, work the screen, how to log on, things like that, that's really where the libraries are helping us, along with providing brochures and things like that. Um, just so you guys know, the, I, I won't go over each of these programs, but the programs that the clients can provide uh, or apply for are such as our food stamp program, which is a SNAP program, energy assistance, social services for aged and disabled, and social services for children and families. Assisted assistance to the aged, blind, and disabled are Medicaid programs, child care programs, and temporary assistance for needy families. Um, we do have some cases where we have refugees apply with us and people with disabilities. So there's a variety of reasons people may come into your um, location to apply for services. And if they're asking about any of these services, then they can just go ahead and get online. And where you would direct them to is our website, which is www.accessnebraska.ne.gov. And I'll show that here in a minute. Um, the structure of our Access Nebraska, we really are meshing parts of our old system with our new system. We, of course, have those four customer service centers that I spoke of. Um, they generally take most of the phone calls and handle the interviews and the immediate um, needs and things like that. So if somebody applies and they're there, that customer service center will go ahead and process the application and handle that. Um, we use that phone system that I mentioned, scanning. We're really taking all the technology pieces and putting them together. And we're combining it so that the universal case management, which is what those customer service centers are doing, and um, putting them into that system. And then if they have a case where they're pending for a while, we're going to have them go to what we call our functional case management, where the workers in the local offices will work on their case. Uh, web services and community partners are also a big part of our structure. So we do like to use the online services whenever possible since it's more effective. Um, and we do ask our community partners, not only local libraries, but we have hospitals and um, different local agencies that help provide housing and things like that that have computers available. And in those areas, they go ahead and may help people actually apply and walk them through the application process. We do realize that with the libraries, you guys don't want to sit there and know the people's personal confidential information. And we're not asking you guys to do that. Again, we're just looking at seeing if you can help them navigate the system. Um, the structure of Access Nebraska has changed this month. So this is new information that you guys are receiving that some people may not know yet. But as of this month, we uh, are now taking the pending applications that come in and the pending reviews. And we're going to assign them a temporary worker meaning we're going to send out a letter that gives them the information of a direct worker and that direct worker's phone number so that they can work with that worker and only that worker during the pending process and get consistent information from the worker. So if somebody would come into your facility and, and want to know maybe how that works, you can tell them to contact a local office or the 1-800 number for Access Nebraska, and we can update them on how that process works. But um, because of some of the phone lines and some things that we've had with the phone lines having a lot of different things going on with them, we want to make sure that we're reaching everybody and giving them consistent information. So that's what the change is for. Once the eligibility is determined with those applications, they're going to be placed back into the Universal Access Nebraska system. Um, once they have another review due, then they'll be assigned another temporary worker. So that's just information just behind the scenes so that you guys know that. Now onto the actual screen that tells you about Access Nebraska. At the top of the screen, you'll see the Access Nebraska website that I mentioned. And then in the middle of the screen, when you log on to that, this is what it looks like for the clients. When they get in there, um, they can click on Enter in English or Enter in Spanish. And that will bring them to this next screen.
And this is really the screen that they're going to work off of. If you can get them into this screen, that'll, that'll really help them. There's a, a lot of options. Some over here on the right, you can see the titles about our programs, such as the SNAP program and Medicaid, some community services. If they want a printed application, that's over here on the right, too. If you see where I'm pointing with the arrow, um, they can actually print a paper application if they don't want to fill it out online. And we have some community partner information and some information down below on how to contact us directly. Uh, for the people that are doing it online, one of the places they can go to is Do I Qualify? And that's a screening site where they can actually see if they're eligible or not. And it doesn't guarantee eligibility, but it at least tells them if they're on the ballpark or not. The application is under the Apply button, where that other blue arrow is. So before they apply, they may want to do that screening. They don't have to. It's not a prerequisite. Um, it just gives them some general information and asks them just some general questions about their income and their household size and things like that. Again, it doesn't say for sure they're eligible. It's not the application. So if they happen to be filling that out and if they ask you something, they just need to be clear that that's not the application. If they fill that out, it's not coming to us. We don't see it at all. It only takes about 10 minutes to complete. They don't have to do that. Um, and it just looks like this. And once they get to um, the questions, they can create a user account. Um, if they go into the actual application, you'll see where this screen starts with application at the top. They don't have to set up a user account. It just is something, if something happens where they get inter interrupted or in your locations, if they have a certain time limit for their application process, again, sometimes it'll take them 24 to 40 minutes to do this. And if you can't allow them the extra time because your location is a busier location, then they could go ahead and set up a user account and come back to that application anytime within 30 days. So if somebody else had to get on the computer for a while, they could get on you know, even in another hour or so. Um, also, if the internet would get disrupted somehow, the, it would go down. This would help make sure that it was safe for them. So again, they don't have to do that. When they complete their application, um, they really, if they come in and they don't have any documentation with them and they really need to get the application in, they can do it with their name, address, and phone number. It's just once they do the interview with us, they're going to have to sit with us either on the phone or in person and fill in the rest of the information that they didn't have before. But if they ever ask any of you, can I just do this, yes. Um, the application itself will highlight if they don't have enough information when they hit submit and it will make it go into a red zone and it'll tell them, you know, this address is needed or your name is needed. We need to know your phone number. Um, and once they submit that application, that makes it so that posting day you submit it is the business day that we are going by. Um, so that helps. And the nice thing about being able to do these applications is, you know, if somebody's, say, you know, right now is Christmas, if it's the middle of the night, Christmas Eve, and they really don't have any money for their kids and, you know, they're really stressing about different things, they could go in and apply right then and there and at least it might allevi alleviate some of that stress that they're feeling and hopefully help their day a little bit. And then as soon as we get back in the office that next business day, we'll have that application for them. So that is one of the benefits of doing this online. Um, they also have the opportunity to have somebody help them complete the application. And again, we're not asking you guys to actually sit down and, and do it for them. Just help them navigate through the computer. Um, and once they get done with the application, make sure they know that they get a confirmation number once they get to the end. If they don't get to the confirmation number, it's not a submitted application. Uh, they can either print that, write it down, or they can go ahead and, and just print, um, save it to like a flash drive or something like that. So it really only helps us to know that they have a confirmation number. It doesn't necessarily help us to find it. We can find that application by other means with their name and social security number, but it really just tells us, yeah, you got to the end. We know you got to the end of it, and it did get submitted. Um, what happens after they submit their application is if it's a type of application where we need to do an interview, we may contact them. If it's not, we may go ahead and just process it, or we may send them a list of what we need. If we need pay stubs or some other information, we'll let them know that through the mail. Do you guys have any questions so far? Uh, Stacy, uh, there is one question. Um, 
and I think you sort of answered it as you're talking about yeah. the online um, application. Um, and I'm not really sure if this is a question for you anyways. Um, but anyway, the question is, what if a person comes into our library and they have no or very limited computer skills? In other words, no knowledge of screens, computers, printing, etc. cetera. Um, if, if you have, and I realize some of you don't have enough time, if you have enough time just to set them down and get them on the computer mm -hmm. and maybe go ahead and log into the website for them, that would be helpful. And then once, mm -hmm. once they get in there, as long as they can type and if they know how to use the mouse or if you can show them how to click, mm -hmm. the application itself is really pretty simple. So it, right. it's really a matter of them getting in, and that's mm. that's where we found some people are just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is part of what we do as librarians anyways. For many of the things that they come to us for, um, not just your applications, is they come into the library wanting help on having to do all of these things because many things are moving to being online forms and online systems and, and applications um, and for submitting things. So. Um, I think it's becoming a lot more common that we are having to um, deal with people who don't have any of this knowledge at all. <laughs> you know, we, we come up with classes and courses and ways to teach them, like the basics of using a mouse type things, and then that helps them get more comfortable with when they do have to come along and actually submit a real application for something. So yes, I think that would help yes, as well, yeah. That is true. And that is part of what I'm here for, too, is if, if there's some communities that need that education, we can come out and do that as well. And then always okay. remember that we have those local offices and those other places where they can go and we can do the paper mm -hmm. application with them. And if there's somebody that can't, mm -hmm. I mean, there are people out there that cannot use the computer and we know that. Right. So mm -hmm. those traditional method, methods are there. So you still have that, you still have the traditional paper as, a ba as, a, as an option as well. So if they are right. completely against computers at all, <laughs> they yes. can always do that still. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Okay, that's the only thing so far. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, and then the interview itself, um, the interviews do go over the application with the clients. We try to do those by phone, and a majority, I, I'd say at least 95% of our applications are being done, as far as the interview goes, by telephone. But we do have those people that like to meet person to person, so we do still offer that. Um, on the application, they just need to mark that they would request a face-to-face. -face. If they forget to do that, they can call in and let us know. Um, that 1-800 number for our customer service centers is 1-800-383-4278. And I did add a note to the bottom of this slide because for the last month, we have had some difficulties with the phone lines being overloaded, and we're addressing those as we speak with, with the new system and ways that we're going to do things. But if they have any trouble at all getting through, if the line's busy or if it's on hold for more than five or ten minutes, just tell them, go ahead and just call the local office. And if they need that number, you know, they can call me if they need to or contact me somehow. But I just want to make sure that they know they can go to those local offices still and get that information as well. Um, to complete the interview, if they're doing by phone and they're doing it through that 1-800 number, just so you guys know, they're going to push prompts. And that's, that's the biggest thing. I don't know if they ever come in to use a phone in your locations, but um, there is a phone cheat sheet. I'll show you where that is a little bit later. But basically to do that, they're going to push number one for benefits um, and number three to complete or reschedule an interview. And when they get on the phone line, it's going to ask for the last four digits of their social security number. If they don't know that, then they can go ahead and, and do it a different way and talk to a person and they'll get them to the right location. And the one thing we want to make sure everybody knows, a lot of people were getting hung up on when they got their letter. Sometimes because the mail system's been a little slower, they're getting the, the application letter from us about the interview after their interview is actually scheduled. So they can call before their interview. They can call after their interview. They just want to call you know, as soon as they can. If they submit an application, part of what we've been recommending is just waiting two days if you submit it online, go ahead and just call in. And you can do the interview even if you haven't gotten the letter yet. Our communication with the Access Nebraska system, again, those traditional methods are still there. We have not taken those away. They can still get us by mail, by fax, email, through the telephone, the local offices, things like that. We've just added those features where they can scan things in to us, and we've added where they can call into that customer service center number and talk to people there. 
So communication, hopefully they will find a way that's the best for them because some of the younger generations don't like to call and talk to us on phone. They don't like to go into the local office. Some of our older generations prefer to go in and actually speak with somebody in person. So we're, we're trying to open it up to be more open to everybody. If they call in, we do have different tracks for clients and prefer providers, and providers are people like uh, child care providers or maybe they provide services in the home. They, they just have different, the same phone number, but they have different numbers they're going to push as they go through. So if the clients want to check on their status or report a change, any of those type of things, they can do that fairly quickly through the phone line. And the same for the providers, if they need to check on their claim or when their payment's coming, things like that. They can do that. And one of our resource development people will talk to them. Those imaging centers that I mentioned, where all the documentation goes to, this is the addresses for them. Um, a lot of the time people like to fax or scan, so this is where the information for you guys comes in handy. If they need the fax number for Lincoln, it's over on the left, it's the 402-471-9209. And then the email is simply dhhs.andycenterlincoln at nebraska.gov. And of course the address of mail is up above there too. And the same for Omaha. Omaha is the 402-595-1901. And theirs is also DHHS Andy Center. The only difference is it says Omaha at Nebraska.gov, so if they're scanning. The one thing we want to make sure that people know is if they're sending us anything in the mail, don't send the originals because they won't be returned to them. Once they scan that information and once they know for sure that it's in, they will go ahead and shred that information. So we don't want any original birth certificates or anything like that. And we also want to make sure that they make sure that we can identify the information that they're sending in. If they send us in a pay stub and, and it doesn't really say who it is or for some reason they go by a different name than normal, maybe they go by their middle name and we have them listed by their first and last name in our case, we won't be able to match that up. So they want to either put their master case number on it or their social security number or you know their full name and birth date. So if they forget to do that, we do have a log of the documentation that we've received that we just don't know where it goes. If they know the day and generally the time and what it looks like, we can find it. So it's not lost, it's just in our file that is unknown file. Um, if they don't, again, if they don't know their master case number, usually that's the best thing to put on it. Just make sure they put enough identifying information on there when they send it in. And sometimes they may be sending that information from, from the library, obviously, through scanning or through the fax. So if you're helping them at all, if you mention to them, make sure they've got something on there for an identifier, it helps. Um, just some tips. If they submit a, a, information to us after a case is closed or denied, they need to call and let us know or submit a new application so that we can attach that to that information. Um, if it's closed, there's a reason it's closed and it's, it won't reopen unless they let us know that they've done something to help us reopen it. Back to that original website screen after they get into the Access Nebraska, there's a report change site. And um, this is a really handy site for people if they don't want to have to call in and they just have a few minutes. If they go in, all they need to do is put in some basic information, such as their name and um, birth, date of birth and Social Security, the last four digits. And what it'll do is it'll bring up this screen. And this screen, what it does is it allows them to tell us if they've moved, if something's changed with their income, you know, maybe their, their child's not in child care anymore, those type of things. So they just simply click on that and they would type that in for us. Generally, the application is pretty simple to fill out and very little needs to be typed to us. Um, some tips for that online change report is they have to have an active or pending case. If, if they're closed, they're not going to be able to get into it. So if somebody comes to you and says, I can't get into my report change, it may just be they need to call us so that we can see what they need to do. Um, again, it's just a really easy way for people to let us know what's going on in their lives um, or if there's a facility that's worth using it just so they know they can report things to us too. It does create a high priority alert for us, meaning the workers work out of what we call a queue, and these type of pieces of information are floated to the top of that queue, and they're considered things that we need to look at right away. 
uh, verification may be needed for whatever they report to us, so we'll probably send them a letter saying this is what we need if we need a new pay stub or, you know, you've gotten a new job, those type of things. Um, they can also use the online change report, and some of them don't know this, to request documents. If they've lost their birth certificate and they need a copy, maybe for a housing agency or something, we can send them a copy of it. Or if they've lost some of their pay stubs, just a, a quick way to get information back from us. They can still, again, use those traditional methods um, as far as contacting a local office and mailing us and things. They can also still call into the customer service center number. And this just tells them, you know, they're going to push one and two. It just gives them some ideas of how they're going to get through that information. If they want to check on their benefits and where their application's at, they call that customer service center number, the 1-800-383-4278 number. Or they can go to the client benefit inquiry. If they set up an account, they can actually go in themselves and look at the application, which makes it a little more independent for them. So where that's located is this bottom box down here where the blue arrow is. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Um, what they need to do in order to get into this is we mail them a PIN number. And they only need to use it once to set up the account. Once they set up the account, they're just going to use their own user ID and password, just like we do on the computer. So if they come into the library and ask how to set this up, they need to have a PIN number with them. If they don't have the PIN number, they're not going to be able to set that up. Um, oops, sorry. So once they choose their own ID and password, then they can check on their case status, if it's pending or if it's active. They can find out how much they're receiving currently for their um, benefits, such as food stamps. If they're receiving, say, $240 for the month, they'll know. Um, historically, if they need to print it out, they can print it out. And a lot of the housing agencies want to know, you know what benefits they've received over the last six months. It's a quick way for them to uh, provide that if they haven't kept, kept their correspondence. We've also added a feature where they can see what um, letters we've sent to them. Some people, again, lose that information, and if they need it again, they can print it out. And the nice new feature that we had come into play just this last October is that auto-population of the reviews. So if they go in to do that review, if they've set up this benefit inquiry, they can go ahead and have that pre-populated for them, and again, just change what's changed, which will make things go much quicker for them. So we're really highly promoting that. And if there's any way you guys can help them, you know, realize that's what they need to do with this benefit inquiry, that's, that's helpful to us. Um, it's becoming increasingly more important, and it, it does make it so they can work more independently so that they'll know what their case is um, and what's going on in their case. And they can check on, once we, once we add this feature, even the documents that they've submitted. They wouldn't have to call and ask, did you get my driver's license? Did you get my pay stubs? They'll be able to look and see that here in the, in the future. Uh, just some PIN number tips. Um, again, it's just a, they're only used to establish that account. Once they're used, they don't have to do it again. We automatically issue them, but if for some reason they misplace the letter or they just never caught on to the fact that we sent them one, they can just call us and we'll send them a new one. Um, that's not a problem at all. We have no problem with doing that. The only thing is, due to security reasons, we can't give them a number over the phone or email. Because, you know, if John Doe calls in and says he's George, we don't know that. Um, you know, he could be actually somebody else. So we want to make sure that we're sending it to the correct person, and how we do that is through the mail with the address that we have on file. So they can call the customer service center, send an online change report, or send an email address to our Access Nebraska questions at nebraska.gov address. And this is just what that looks like when they set up that account. They just need to go over here where the black arrow is and create a new account to set it up. Once they get it set up, then they can go way over here on the left and whatever user ID and password they set up, they just log in over there. And it just works very slick for them. And once they get in, and they fill out that information, it just looks like that. It does ask security questions, just like a lot of us have with our bank accounts and things like that. If they forget what their password is that they set up, it can trigger them to remember with some of these extra questions. And then the, 
benefit inquiry screen, just so you guys kind of know what it'll look like when they bring it up, this shows that there's a person who is active for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That used to be our food stamp program. It's just a new name that they came up with. And it just shows that they're active and they're getting $200 a month. You go down farther and it shows, you know, aid to dependent children. Um, they were denied down there at the bottom. So they, they didn't get that program or that grant money. Um, and then if they need to, you know, view additional information here about each situation and each program, because each one of these is a different program that we have, of services that we offer, they just click on this case detail where the red arrow is pointing to, and it'll bring them more information on who's in that case and who's active. Because sometimes one of their children will be active and another one won't. And this is what that looks like when they do that. It just gives them a lot more information and why they may have, you know, not been eligible and things like that. <laughs> and then our last button on the beginning screen there for the website is Submit Documents. This is one I think you guys will really, really be utilizing there at the library. If somebody needs to upload and submit documents to us, they really need to have an account set up with an email address. So if they don't have an email address, they might need some help from you guys to set that up. And then once they go in and do that, we recommend that they save the document that they're scanning and then send it in an email as an attachment. That seems to be the most effective way for us to get the information. Um, if they need any help with that, hopefully you guys can help them. And we can really accept just about any type of information except for an application itself. Um, so anything they want to send us, as long as it's legible enough to be scanned, we can get that from them. The reason we don't accept the applications, the paper applications, is we need their original signature on it. With the electronic application, we're getting an electronic signature, but that's not the case with scanned and fax documents. So it does help, again, if they scan those ahead of time before they begin the process. And they can be accepted in almost any format now. It used to be we were a little bit limited, but our, our structure has grown, so we are able to accept about any format. And we will send a confirmation to them, and that's why that email address is important. We want to make sure they know that we did receive the information. And this would go back to the, the people who don't have a computer. Um, you know, if they don't have a computer, hopefully if they come to you guys, you guys can help them on. We do have computer kiosks in the office, and if somebody really isn't computer savvy, we have workers that will sit down and help them fill out that application. We have some other community partners that actually do more case management type things. They will also sit down with the clients and help them. So if they go to the Access Nebraska website, it will give them a list of our local offices, and it will also give them a list of our community partners that have kiosks and, and different things that they can utilize. Um, just so you guys know, I've been using community partner lingo quite a bit through this presentation. Community partners are agencies and organizations that have volunteered to help our clients with items, such as the application process, um, even just the brochures. If any of you don't have our Access Nebraska brochures at your location, I know most of the libraries have agreed to at least provide that information and help people just get on the computer. Um, I can bring out brochures and mail out brochures to you if you request that. So can the other community support specialists. And um, again, you know, they just help them do the navigate our system. Community partners are listed up on our website, over here where the blue arrow is on the right. And again, you know, we just let the people know with our website, and I'll show you that here in just a minute, um, how, many, or how many different locations we have and how that looks. But we want to make sure to let people know if they have a printer. You guys would probably be listed as having a printer that they can use, having a computer they can use. Um, it's up to you guys whether you're listed as, you know, helping them and handing out brochures. So we always ask all of our community partners, you know, if they're willing to be on our website, we appreciate it. It's not requiring anybody to do any more work than you're already doing. We're only asking, you know, if you do provide those services to people, it makes a really convenient location for them to look. And we do have some unique community partners, um, some of the schools, some of the homeless organizations. Um, you know, we even have some of the pharmacies that are community partners for us. So this just kind of gives you an idea of what some of those people look like. And this is what the website looks like when we get into that community partner section. 
Um, down at the bottom, you'll see it'll, it'll show them the county and the city and the community partners that's there, what kind of clients they serve. And the little icons above are like the computer monitor, the printer, if there's somebody that's actually going to sit with them and help them, just and if, if they can provide brochures. Um, in this case, the two that are listed do provide all of those services. Looks like they provide case management as well. And if a person clicks on anywhere in the map, if they click on, say, Wayne County, which is where I'm at, it'll bring up all the Wayne locations. So wherever you are, it will bring up that location for them. And if you're on our website, it will bring you up there as well. Uh, what we need to do is just have your permission to add you to our website and add you to this list if you want us to. They can also type in the city or type in the county. So there's a lot of different ways for them to get into this map. The other feature that will be helpful to you, especially for those that don't know how to navigate through our system, there's a how-to tutorial over here on the right. And what that looks like is when they click on it, it brings up our phone cheat sheets up here towards the top. Um, there's some frequently asked questions about our automated phone line. The piece that I think you guys will really like is where the blue arrow is. There's video tutorials and computer tips for customers. Of course, we've got the kiosk locations and all of that. This is where you find them. But, but if you go in there, these video tutorials, there's how to apply. There's a place where it walks them through what our interview is going to be like. And it would be the same as you sitting here watching me do this presentation. It's a recorded presentation about all of this. Uh, coming attractions. We are going to, in March, hopefully have the ability for people to request their PIN number online. They won't just be able to, right now they can just call us to get it. Um, this will make it so that they don't even have to call us and we'll, make, we'll send them a new one. And we're also going to try to have the ability to view the submitted documents that were received by us. Again, some people are calling in just to see if we got their driver's license and things like that. So the computers are going to be more and more a part of what we're doing for a lot of people, especially as the younger generations start to, you know, apply and as they become, you know, I think as they get older, they'll probably utilize the computers more and more as well. So I think you'll see them more and more in your locations if they don't have one of their own. Um, and then we're hoping to have the ability for people with interim social security numbers. Some of them are, are just becoming citizens and things like that, and they're eligible for services, but they don't have a regular social security number yet. So we're trying to set it up so they can also use a benefit inquiry feature. Um, that should be up and running here shortly. Do you guys have any questions about any of this information? Um, there haven't been any new questions that have come in yet. Um, if anybody does have any questions or comments or anything, please um, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, or if you have a microphone, let me know and I can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Wait and see if anything urgent comes in yet. Um, just want to let everyone know while we were going through this, I did, um, in preparation for recording as we normally do, we put any um, associated websites and links into the Library Commission's Delicious account so that that's then available when the recording goes up. So um, the Access Nebraska website has been added there. So you'll be able to quickly jump to that um, to explore it and see what's, what it's all about as well. And I should tell you guys, we do encourage you to go ahead and play with the website. The mm. only thing you don't want to do is submit an application. You can go through <laughs> the entire application, just don't hit submit, and it'll make you more and more familiar with our site. Um, if you click on that Learn More About Access Nebraska area, when you first pull up the website, that brings up all those other menus that I showed with the cheat sheets and stuff and the video tutorials. So play with that as much as you want. We encourage that. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of good um, help information on the site itself that people really, even if they don't have a librarian near next to them or you staff people, your staff people next to them, um, to help them figure out how to use everything on there. Mm -hmm. And that's really and good, even, yeah. And even if they call into a library, you guys may be able to just help them that way too, just let them know that that's available to them. Right, click over here, look for this, follow the help guides and it'll help you get through it, yeah. Well, it doesn't look like anything, any new questions have come in, so um, must have covered everything <laughs> that they needed to know. <laughs> I appreciate this opportunity to or, do this. Yeah. If, or, um, Kristen, do you mind, if, if you do have 
if anybody has anything that's working or not working or any suggestions, like I said at the beginning, we are continuing to improve and grow and make uh, improvements to our website as well. So if you have any of those suggestions, um, again, my contact information is Stacy, which is S-T-A-C-Y, dot Shank, which is S-C-H-E-N-K, at Nebraska.gov. So we appreciate any and all feedback. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like you said, yeah, a lot of changes have happened just in what the last month <laughs> to the website yeah. to into what the processes are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess that's it. Yeah, no new questions. Thank you very much, Stacy. That was yes, actually, yeah, very good info. Um, so that uh librarians know how to you know help the people that are coming in to use this and you're not the only service that we're that is that is going more and more online as I said earlier <laughs> um, so it's good to try and get as many of these people onto our show as possible to get some good information some good direction for us to um, keep helping all of the citizens in the state uh, get what they need get the services that we provide for them so thank you very much um, for uh, doing this today for us um, I'm gonna since you don't have any more questions coming in, I'm going to um, mute uh, you and take back presenter control here. Thank you again. You, yep, thank you. Um, go. There go. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending our On Compass Live this morning. Uh, the show has been recorded, so the recording will be available later. So if you do want a need a refresher or to hear some more detail about something that Stacy talked about, you'll be able to go ahead and watch the recording later. It will be posted on our website that I'm showing you here. Uh, I hope you'll join us next week when our Encompass Live topic is Nebraska's Carnegie Libraries. Uh, the good, the bad, and the beautiful. Uh, Lorraine Riedzel, who's the director at Beatrice Public Library, has a presentation about um, the history of Carnegie Libraries in the state of Nebraska. So that's, I think, going to be a very interesting uh, topic. So hopefully you'll join us next week for that Encompass Live. And um, if you are on Facebook, we do have a Facebook page for the show that you can follow. In addition to posting onto our website whenever we have um, the new shows coming up and uh, recordings going up, we do have a Facebook page. So if you're into Facebook, you can like us there on Facebook. And you'll be notified whenever any um, shows are starting, new things have been added, um, when recordings are made available. So you'll be able to keep track, keep up with the show from there if you want to. Um, other than that, thank you very much for attending. Sign up for our future shows, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.